All right, I'm back to do a review of Kutnahora City of Silver. As you can see, we have a game going on here and we are currently in the fifth round, but I feel it's early enough to give my impressions of this game. We got it with reservations because I had read it wasn't really ideal for two players, but since Suzanne had actually been to Kutnohora, she was curious about it based on that association of actually being there. Well, I have to say I am disappointed with this game in a lot of regards. It was hyped up quite a bit with the Essen releases. And I'm just gonna go over some of the things I really didn't like about it. Well, first of all, let's just talk about the things I did like about it. Um, the box was really heavy. I don't know if this is a, not really a positive, but I noticed it was really heavy. There was a lot of stuff in here. It's a bit of a table hog, so it's my first negative. We barely got it to fit on this table. And I actually didn't have room to put these, these market devices on the table. We had to keep those on the couch. So uh, the positive part is that these pieces are really nicely done. They call this rewood, and it's a process of using, uh, I guess, pulp or leftovers from wood processing and they mix it with something to make these uh, pieces. So it's not plastic and it's not wood, but you get a lot of good detail in whatever way they're using this for mold. So it definitely is better than just having cubes on the board. So that looks good. The double, the double sided boards here are good, though you are required to tape them together, which I didn't really like and I didn't find necessary. You can just fold them and they pretty well lay flat. Um, other than that, <laughs> I don't have much good to say about it. Uh, the thing that struck me with this game, first of all, is the rules are confusing. We missed some key things in how buildings are built here and the costs associated with building. It's totally different for taking a, um, um, a building action compared to a plot action. So we had actually been paying the wrong prices in the beginning and we had to reverse some things. So that took a while to get that sorted out about how they price. And, you know, adjacency rules, you know, you have to bring in a plot um, to build. So you have to base the price on what you're next to. Um, so there was confusion there and there's some rules examples for end game scoring that made absolutely no sense at all. They were talking about winning majorities in the mining here, you know, they count up the, the, the stars to see what category of points it will score. And then of course, who has got the, the majority of the stars in the, the row. But they had an example where they would say, if two players are tied for second and third, now, what does that mean? How could you possibly be tied for second and third place? You're either tied for second place or you're tied for third place. You can't be tied for second and third. So I still don't know how that final scoring works because of that uh, confusion there. Well, that's just a minor point. I find that there are mechanisms in this game and it wants to be a market economy game that obviously involve these this contraption which seems really cool at first because you've got all these cards and they're numbered and they change the costs of wood and this would be ore and silver and this would be um, contracts i guess uh for, for land and workers and then you're supposed to pull the slider out when a card tells you to move it so that would be for example a card like this one here that has a little arrow next to it that would tell you to pull the slider on the uh, on the beer one over and then you get a new price so what you have is kind of a 
manipulating the economy based on what buildings you buy and put out and they will move these sliders and some other actions like that one there in the bottom left corner is telling you to move a population card take it out and then see if the you know what changes in this case we have a three four six and they, taking this out doesn't change it at all so a lot of times it will take two cards or more to even change the numbers and so you're changing the market prices like this and you only have control of the three guilds that you start the game with in my case it was these three so you see the symbols on there i've got the the food market and the contracts market and wood the other player Suzanne has uh, access to the beer market, ore and silver guilds. So she can only buy buildings that are associated with those guilds. So you have absolutely zero control over the market change or influence of those guilds. So she can never control food or any of the, the I'm in complete control of wood and that's really what the game is sort of based around is, you know, you're trying to manipulate your market to your advantage so that you get paid out the big bucks. So I had made some mistake early on where I was building down here and I thought it was going to be good to build. And then, you know, I would move the ore. Um, I'd gain two ore production and then the, this would move the uh, ore cards to change the thing. And it actually only resulted in me gaining one income. But then it was a huge increase for Suzanne. So, you know, you have to learn how the market is going to affect you. And you don't really see it on here initially because a lot of the time I'm just like, well, what's going to happen next? I had to pull the card out. Oh, you see, that's going to happen next. There's a bad thing. So I didn't really like this hidden economy. It would have been much better to have this all open information so that you could see, oh, here we have 256 right now. And now if, uh, you know, the next card gets removed, you'll get to see. I don't know why this had to be hidden. What was the point of that? It just made it frustrating if you're early in a game and you're really not sure how this works, that suddenly you'll do something you think is good for you and it turns out to be really bad for you. So, you know, you can chalk that up to a learning game. But I got to tell you, with so many games out there and so many games to play, I just do not care about giving games multiple chances when I've got so many other things that don't upset me, you know, on the first play. I mean, normally my first experience on a board game is usually pretty positive because you're hyped, you know, you've got, you bought it, you paid for it, you want it to be good. So you play it and uh, usually you're having a good time because you're getting something fresh and new. In this game, I actually was frustrated throughout the game. And, you know, one of the reasons was the way this worked. The second reason, and this is a big one, these contraptions with the market sliders are just terrible. They're super tight so that even a couple pulls on this device on these levers will cause damage. I mean, look at this. There's already paper ripped off this thing. And that was from just putting it in. I don't even think this has moved. You can see that this is still at the edge here. So this has not actually been used to the game. This from putting it into the contraption already, you've got damage. So basically, if I want to sell this game and I'm going to sell it, I can't even say like new anymore because it's got damage. Same here. Look at this. Every edge just from moving it once or putting the thing together, damage, scraped off, paint. And uh, that I find is just ridiculous. Like, didn't they play test this? Didn't they get this back from the, from the uh, factory and go, you know what? These sliders are really tight. And you can see that it's gonna be damaged just from a little bit of use. I don't understand that at all. They could have easily made these slots one millimeter wider these did not have to be tight they just had to be in there that you would see the number you know they could have left a little leeway in movement up and down so that there was no damage nope 
So I find this really amazing that this got through testing. There've been a lot of complaints about this. And I think in response, the company has actually released an app for the game. So now you can play it without using these things. And I'm pretty sure this is in response to the, uh, to the problems with this mechanism. So if you go into um, uh, the app, it just shows it to you like this. So this is basically, you know, uh, it would be Suzanne's current income level already calculated at 53 if she chooses to take an income action. And then there's mine at 43. Now that's really great because normally you have to go through your board and go, oh, wait a second, here are my sliders. I have to go four times now on the on the meat track or the food track and look at what the number is. So I'm going to get four times four um, income, which is 16. Then I got to go through each one of these. So that's going to take, you know, maybe 30 seconds. But this saves a bit of time so you can instantly see, oh, I'm going to get um, 53 income if I do it this round. And then this is the uh, state of the cards. We know that the 15 should be showing on the ore marker, which it does. And this one is a 12 which it shows, but you know, we made mistakes. We ran both of these things simultaneously. And I, I noticed that this, there were a few mistakes in here that I didn't have on the app. So if you want to play an accurate game, I recommend just play the app because we forgot to move cards a few times, which totally screwed up the numbers on here. And I was like, why are these not the same? And I had to go back and forth to check things out. So I would say that this could be completely removed from the game. It's not necessary. They could have knocked the price down 10 bucks by taking that out. I would have been fine with it if they said, look, you have an app for the scoring. And I'd say, great. Okay, not everybody's crazy about having apps in games. I don't think, you know, it's a huge deal because everybody usually has a phone now. I mean, who doesn't? So maybe if the, you know, support for the game ended, you maybe would lose the app. So I guess that would be the one drawback. But I find this is just complete BS, not necessary. And I don't like the hidden economy. So the other things I didn't like um, would be this church building. This to me is just seems like a tacked on item because it has to do with the church. The historical aspect, I get it that it's based on history. But the problem is, these are all put out numerically. So every game, you're gonna get the exact same rewards in the exact same sequence. I couldn't believe that. I mean, almost every game now is a modular setup for things like this, where it would vary game to game how things come out, you know? And here, you're always gonna get these rewards at that exact same stage. I also found some of these rewards like completely imbalanced, like this one, for instance. This is like, I think, overpowered. A lot of people think it isn't, but I think it is. I was trying really hard to get this, and then I couldn't get it because Suzanne had, um, she had the pelican tiles and I didn't at the time, so I was desperately trying to get the pelican tile in time and I couldn't do it. She was able to get this, she got $80 income for doing two income actions. Now, money is everything in this game. You only get income through taking an income action on your card, which is this. So you've got two opportunities to do that in your hand of six cards. So over uh, you know, a round, you have three turns of playing two cards, then your next turn, two cards, and then your last turn, one card. That would be end of the round. So two chances to do income. You need a lot of money to build buildings. As you see, the costs on there are the cost of the wood in the middle, times whatever is on the, the wood track at this point would be times three. So that is $24 to build that building. And the early rounds, you are really tight on money. I remember having to do a income action twice in a row. Uh, at $11 income each, just to try to afford to make one building. So to um, score that much money from one tile, I think is too much. And it's an obvious thing to go for it. Like, why wouldn't you? You're gonna get 80 bucks. That's money that can be spent on buying four buildings in future turns, 
where the other person might not only have half of that. Of course, the downside is you get in a minus two on reputation. Who cares? The minus reputation track is no big deal. First of all, you start at zero. You've got, you can hit minus two before you even start losing any points for at the end of the game scoring. So you've got already that space of going to minus two, which is why I did it. One time I didn't pay taxes because I thought, no, money's too important. I'm just going to take the minus. So that is not a big deal to get the minus two. So, and then, you know, she did that and she got her 80 bucks. And then I did the next, the next one available was this, which is to place a free artisan, uh, one of these guys into the council. Now, I absolutely didn't care about this. I didn't want it. So I have now, I got a tile sitting here that I can't use because I don't want this reward. And it gives you two points because I find it, there's another thing is the artisan section of the game. I also find it tacked on. These only come into play after the third round. These guys are supposed to affect end game scoring in various categories. The problem is you have to pay 10 bucks to get them from, you know, being considered for the council, which is here. There's actually supposed to be spread out here. There's two guys waiting to get in the council. The only way you get them in the council is take an income phase. And then you have the option of paying 10 bucks to put one of these guys in there. So now, obviously, you want something really good for that 10 bucks, right? 10 bucks is a lot of money. It's important to have money. Why would you spend the 10 bucks unless it absolutely benefited you in some way much more than the other player? The fact is, it doesn't really. Every one of these things, if you, by the time you're able to actually use them and get the scoring for them, which only happens at the end of the fourth round, see right there, four, five, and six, everybody is pretty clear and pretty even on all these aspects. There might be one that the other person has nothing to do with, but you really only want to do that if you have a clear advantage in getting some points. Why should I spend 10 bucks so that some uh, scoring majority thing here gives me one point and gives Suzanne one point? Why would I do that? Or I get two points and she gets two points. Or I get two points and she gets one point. Why would I spend 10 bucks for that? So I'm finding a lot of these things are just, they're just not uh, worth it for the money invested and the little bit they're doing to manipulate the score. So I think that is completely tacked on. You could cut this whole side of the board off and not have it. This game I really see as being a three or four player game minimum. Two player game, they tell you it's two player, but it isn't. First of all, they bring in event cards at the top there to try to give you some more things going on in a two player game, which they're not supposed to be used in a higher count game you know, increasing taxes and little things happen at the end of the round. It's not a big deal. You know, manipulate, move these things around. So uh, the problem is, like I say, two players strictly set to three guilds each. There is no crossover. So if I am manipulating the wood market and Suzanne doesn't like what I'm doing, there's no way for her to affect the wood market. Overall, you're just manipulating your own guilds to your own ends and you can't really affect like Suzanne having the ore market she was able to get in really heavy on mining here and pretty well lock me out of uh, scoring opportunities early on that's another aspect that's not in the three or four player game because when you have the th three or four player game there is crossover in guilds where you know, the third player will have access to probably one of these and one of these colors in their selection so that multiple people can affect the situation. So, yeah, I wasn't crazy about that. I think I'm going to actually give this probably a 3 out of 10, which um, is really low for me and quite surprising. Um, I think it's a bit of a table hog. It takes a long time to play. I found uh, too many points of frustration through the game. I mean, obviously, you can have a learning curve on games. I'm going to give it one more chance to see how it works and then decide. But I find, you know, even here in the market area, I mean, you've got you've got this city building part. And this is OK, but it takes a long time to actually build anything. I mean, you have 
the six cards of which only five can be used in a round, okay? Five. It takes almost, it takes at least three to four actions to build a building. First, you have to get a plot marker. It's one of these cubes. You know, buy a plot, that's a card. Then you have to get the tile from here, which is getting the rights for it, where it will then go in here. That's another card. Then you have to build the building and put the tile out. That's another card. And for me, sometimes it was four actions because I wouldn't have enough income to build the building, which you can see it can get really expensive, eight times three. And then I had to take two income actions to save up the money to buy the building. So in all together, that was what, five? <laughs> five card actions, which is a whole round to get a building out. That I think is ridiculous. And you know, that's one round. There's only six rounds in the game. So I don't know. I just fell over felt you didn't get much joy out of this, you know. I mean, a lot of people think, "Oh, yeah, there's a um, a lot you can do and there might be with a four player game might be way more interesting." But as it is right now, I cannot recommend this as a two player game. If this was module setup that changed every game, it would definitely improve it. The mining part also seems a bit tacked on. There's not a lot of points to be had here compared to building. Getting adjacencies for these very expensive public buildings, you know, that took a lot of money for me to put out. And then you want to gain the benefits of being next to these symbols. So I don't know what thematically what that means. It has no meaning in the game. So if, for instance, here, I'm next to this building. So because I have, they share a symbol, I will get one extra, I'll get one point at the end of the game for being next to this. Uh, if there was a yellow symbol in here, I would then get three points because it would show that there's, all three of these symbols would count. So right now I'm only counting the one. And that's the same on all these public buildings. They have three symbols. So you can get some good adjacency bonuses if you can find tiles that will match up with this. Now look at this point in the game here. I've got this big one out here, and I purposely put it down here so Suzanne wouldn't get the point bonus for being next to this. So I made it isolated down towards me. Now, when we look at the market, you see the upper left corners of all these tiles, you want to have these yellow and red symbols and there is one right here, which has that symbol, but I can't buy that because it's not my guild, you see? That's Suzanne's guild, not my guild. So that is out of contention. So we keep looking at the other tiles. Here's another one, the, uh, the horse mill. Again, it has a yellow symbol that would fit against this one adjacency. Can't buy it because it's not my guild. So this was another frustrating aspect of the game. The entire board now has really nothing that I can buy to put next to this very expensive building. So it's just kind of random, you know, what comes up here. These were all shuffled. I've got a tile now here ready to place. And obviously I can't put it here. I'd, you know, be trying to work it towards this one. So that's where I bought the space. But meanwhile, this is all open. And now, of course, Suzanne can come in here by buying one of those tiles that she has a symbol that can match this and she'll probably put it here. And then she'll get the points off my big purchase. So this could be fun for a lot of people, but I'm finding this also a bit frustrating because I'm like, oh, I can't even buy anything now that will fit here. I have to wait for it to show up. You know, maybe it'll be under the next tile underneath this. See, there's one that... Um, well, can I even buy this? No, I think uh, that's also not anything I can buy. So yeah, there's frustrations in this. Feels like a lot of tacked on stuff. This not necessary, this not necessary. Event cards kind of us to fix a two game that really can't be fair need more players. There's this battling around here, which is not really satisfying. Uh, I don't get the thematic connection symbols mean why I have a bonus to this at the end of the game. 
you going to start here. Everybody going to start in a corner. It's just an obvious move that you would start building in a corner so you could get a point for matching the symbol. But what does it mean? <laughs> is it po in the city building scheme of things? What is it? I don't know. It's not explained. And of course, the mining is explained because it's thematic part of Kutnohora that they did a lot of mining. So that's fine. But again, when you build a mine here, it tells you you're going to take three tiles at random. In the beginning of the game, it's only the first tile you can take at random. And you don't know what's on it. It might be something with a star, or it might be just something blank that makes something move. You just don't know. You're taking your chances. So you see here earlier, we're into the fifth round, and the score is only four to three. <laughs> So most of the scoring is going to happen at the end of the game. So yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of disappointed with this. Like I say, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get through one more game, but I think it's most likely on the sell pile. So they can't all be winners, and we're generally into heavy games. I mean, we love Darwin's Journey. That game kind of fit everything. I had a good time in that game. Um, it was thematic. The decisions were interesting. It wasn't like frustrating getting through the rule book. It's a fail for us. So I would say this is going on the burn pile. Hopefully I can recoup the money that I spent or at least 60% of what I spent. That's it for another review. And I'm probably not even gonna bother showing a playthrough of this game. I'm always gonna be completely honest about purchases. I don't get any funding or sponsorship for any of these videos that I make. Uh, every game is bought with my own hard earned money and I'm going to be completely honest about it. I don't have the need to give games multiple chances to make them shine. It's pretty well based on first impressions. If something isn't really clicking on the first or the second game, then it's gone. All right, uh, I'll see you on the next video.